Well, I hope we're all coming off of a, a grateful and enjoyable time by God's grace over the Thanksgiving holiday, and a special again welcome to those of you who might be visiting over this holiday. At our meal, we had the opportunity to go around and give thanks, of course, for what we were most grateful for, excluding our family, which is uppermost, and it was easy for me. I didn't even have to pray about it, but I'm grateful for our congregation and the privilege that God has given me to serve and shepherd here, and especially the humility and the spiritual hunger that the Lord has given us, however imperfect, but yet growing and evident for his word. And so we pray that will continue, and we'll excel still further, even as we turn now to God's word in the gospel of Matthew. So please take your Bibles and turn with me in the New Testament, the first book, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. And we are going to learn, even as we have just sung, how our servant King, the Lord Jesus Christ, calls us to follow Him and to come to Him. Matthew chapter 9, we'll look at the first eight verses. In Matthew 9, 1, it is written, and getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him together in prayer. Our great God and Father, we bless you and praise you and give you thanks for the plea we have before your throne now in the Lord Jesus, and that we come to you in him, seek your grace through him, and pray by the power of his spirit our hearts and minds would be attentive to your word as you speak to us. We pray, our God, that you would undo and retrain and conform our minds out of the mold of this world and into the mold of your word, of your beloved Son. And we pray that you would help us think differently about ourselves and others and about your Son, our Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified by our lives. Father, give us ears to hear hearts to see. Be with the preacher, that the preaching of your word may be your word to your church for her edification and upbuilding, and to call even those outside your son to yourself this morning. We ask this, Father, for your glory and for the great fame of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. While he was a medical student, Martin Lloyd-Jones realized something about the human condition that forever changed his life. In the 1920s, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a medical resident in the poorest areas of London, and he was shocked for the first time in his life to see the destitution among London's poorest, and especially the great immorality and scandal that marked so many of their lives. But then, Lloyd-Jones apprenticed under the king's physician, Dr. Horder, and there he was attending among the rich and powerful elite of England. Patients included prime ministers and the most wealthy, and to his astonishment, Lloyd-Jones observed that these people, the wealthy who had everything the world could offer, were suffering from the same issues as the poor as he saw in London slums. It astounded him that their problem wasn't physical. Their problem wasn't their conditions. It was moral. It was even spiritual. And that observation, that the rich and the poor shared the same basic problem 
begin to undo all of this young man's assumptions about life and humanity and how people change and flourish. And it caused him in his early 20s to reconsider the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It may surprise us when we turn to the gospel that the emphasis on Jesus' message and ministry was his authority. The Lord Jesus did not come to earth as a wandering sage. He came as a king making decrees. That's the main point if you go backward a couple chapters to the Sermon on the Mount. The main point of the sermon is the authority of Jesus. He begins in chapter 5 settling disputes among the most learned religious people of the day with, I say to you, done. And then at the end of the sermon, in chapter 7, he ends with an illustration that begins in verse 24 about hearing his words and doing them. And he says in Matthew 7, 26, that everyone who hears his words and doesn't do them is like the fool who builds his house on the sand, and when the floods come, it will all fall down greatly. Now, flood is a deep metaphor, an image that comes out of the Old Testament referring to the judgment of God. It's an apt metaphor when you think of the Middle East that is largely a dry, arid region, and those in rains and flooding, you have those dry desert riverbeds become raging torrents in a sudden and move away everything in its midst. And so in the Bible and Jesus picking up here, floods represent the raging torrent of the judgment of God rushing against people. But here, Jesus is saying that those who, fighting off a sneeze, thank you, Uh, Those who live according to his words only are the ones that will survive the flood of God's judgment. That's an amazing claim. That to live and follow according to what I say is the only way to survive the coming judgment of God. That's astounding. What would be the first question that would pop in your mind if you heard a man make such a claim? Prove it, right? And so that's exactly what Jesus does. The people are, at the end of verse 27, verses 28 and 29, astonished because he's teaching as one who had authority. He was never like any other teacher. He didn't quote others. He didn't hide, hide behind anyone else's authority. He didn't leave issues in shades of gray. He spoke in startling black and white with incredible confidence and says the difference between life and death, between judgment and salvation is what you do with my words. And so the rest of the chapters that follow after chapter 7 is demonstrating that authority, proving it. So as we glance into chapter 8, verse 2, a leper comes to him and asks about Jesus' will to cleanse him, not his ability, his will, bowing before his authority. In verse 8, the centurion recognizes that with just a word, Jesus' authority is dispatched. Just by a word. It continues in chapter 8, if you look over at verse 16, Jesus is casting out spirits and healing with a word. With a word, he banishes everything that afflicts us. Likewise, beginning in verse 18, Jesus' authority is underscored as he says those who follow him and lean on him can have no other competing affections in their hearts, not even their families, not even their worldly possessions. Everything is left behind for Jesus. Everything is cast aside for him. And then out on the sea with his disciples, The disciples marvel as Jesus calms the storm and then ask in verse 27 of chapter 8, what sort of man is this? Even the sea obeys him. And even as we go to the last part of chapter 8, you even have in verse 29 the demons recognizing, what do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Even demons confess his cosmic rule and authority. Are you beginning to get the picture? All of Jesus' healings, all his displays of power, they're pointing to the one truth he's already stated. He has authority. He's in charge. 
He walked around like he owned the place. And all of his demonstrations, all of his power and healings, they're audiovisuals. They're pictures of his authority, what he's always, already declared. His word is truth. His word does separate between life and death and heaven and hell. And so all of these then prepare us for the next encounter at the beginning of chapter 9, where here Jesus reveals that all of our problems, everything he has authority to banish and deal with, there is one that is most basic. There is one that is most crucial. And it's sin. And in this encounter, the Holy Spirit teaches us that the Lord Jesus has authority to deal with our real problem, our most basic problem, that we can be assured that Jesus alone has authority to deal with our sin. And also that we as a church remember that our message and mission alone is Jesus has authority to deal with sin. We see our real problem and our real message with Jesus' real authority in this encounter with the paralytic and the scribes. Now, if you look at this paragraph in verses 1 to 8, you'll notice it revolves around verbs of seeing. Notice verse 2, Jesus saw their faith of the friends and the paralytic. And in verse 4, you'll notice that verb knowing has a footnote and the better manuscripts, and you'll notice here, read it as perceiving or seeing, and even other some translations leave that in the main text, which I would suggest should be there. Jesus seeing their thoughts. And then again, the crowds in verse 8 saw it, saw Jesus heal. So we're invited to enter into this interaction and, and grab different points of view and take a, take a glance at what Jesus saw in the paralytic, what he saw in the scribes, and then what the crowd saw in Jesus, which leads us to reflect then on what we're to see in what's happened here. So what I want to do is ask and answer three questions. What did Jesus see in the suffering? What did Jesus see in the scribes? And what did the crowd see in the Savior? And then we'll ask at the end one last question, what must the church say about the Savior? Well, let's look first in the first two verses. What does Jesus see in the suffering? Jesus here, we're told, verse 1, is crossing back to the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, of this large lake. It's into Capernaum. Capernaum's his own city. It's not Nazareth. Capernaum's his home base for his ministry, and was the hometown of Peter and other disciples, and was the focal point of Jesus' ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Of course, Jesus is well known there. And so people we find in verse two, 2 are streaming to him. And some people are bringing to him a paralytic brought by his friends. Now, to be paralyzed is a very great trial. But in the first century, to be paralyzed or disabled was beyond what we can even conceive. The disabled in the first century were social outcasts. It was assumed and taken for granted that if you were disabled or paralyzed, that you had been cursed by God with that affliction for some reason. We know that's how even the best of people thought because Jesus' own disciples in John chapter 9, when they come across a blind man, they ask, who sinned, Jesus, him or his parents? Their operating assumption is that he'd done something to deserve his malady, his disability. So what we have when people are bringing a paralytic to Jesus, you have these friends taking, and this paralytic taking a tremendous social risk. They're breaking all conventions by bringing their friend on a bed so publicly before the Lord. Now in our individualistic culture, this may not seem like much to us. I mean, if there's a good TV on sale, we don't think anything of elbowing our neighbor to get to it. But back in this day, to put yourself forward in this honor and shame culture of the first century was risky. They're disregarding all social convention. They're disregarding all shame by, by not keeping the paralytic on the margins where he belongs, where someone cursed by God should stay. And this paralytic would have had no way to be gainfully employed, depended entirely on alms and charity. So what people thought of him mattered. Mattered. 
And so you have here a picture in verse 2 of men confident in Jesus, willing to risk, willing to step out to get to him. And we're told in verse 2, Jesus sees that. He sees that very thing. We're told in verse 2, first, he sees their faith, their risk, their breaking of conventions demonstrates they trust who Jesus is. They believe what he said of himself. The authority he said he had, they believed he had. And so they came to him. But I want us to notice, secondly, what Jesus sees. Jesus sees something that ought to pull you up by your shirt collar. Jesus sees the man's need in a way that I'm venturing to guess none of us would see first. Here, Jesus in verse 2, is challenging our materialism, our materialistic worldview. We are materialists. The assumptions of materialism are all around us, so much that we don't even notice it. We just assume it's, it's normal. Some would argue materialism is good. The growth of science and technology and all the, the comforts that we take for granted comes from our focus on the physical and material world. But that's a misdirection. Of course, we should be grateful for all of the development of the natural sciences and medicine. And as someone who's been struggling with illness and has surgery on the horizon, I thank God it's not the first century. Very grateful. But that didn't begin because of materialism. In fact, early medicine and the scientific method was started by Christians who knew there was order in God's creation. No, materialism is an assumption. Materialism is actually a, a claim of faith. Materialism says because all that we can measure, because the only thing we can observe or quantify is material, the observable world, then that's all there is. But you didn't learn that in a lab. That's not a deduction from an experiment. Nobody's looked into a microscope and no one's looked out of a telescope and determined that all that there is is material and physical. There's no method that has disproven the spiritual world. That's an assumption. That's a religious claim without any hard data. That's a belief. And we all are influenced by that assumption. It's the air we breathe, the water we swim in. We assume it in small ways when we make comments like, well, all we can do is pray. But is that how the Bible presents prayer? As that last-ditch effort that you do when you've tried to do everything else that really counts? No, no, that's a materialist mind coming out when we say all we can do is pray. Our materialism comes out in big ways, like the billions that American Christians and the visible church spend on physical relief here and around the world, compared to the paltry millions we spend on evangelists and missionaries and Bible translators and church planners. We drink in materialism. We assume it goes without saying that what's physical is most important, that what's material is most vital. And so when we look again at verse 2 and look at what Jesus sees about this paralytic's need, your sins are forgiven. Jesus sees a man on a mat in the first century, and the first thing he sees is his sins. His sins. Now, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect compassion perfect mercy and grace. He sees a man that cannot walk. He sees a paralytic in a day when he suffers social oppression and injustice. Before ADA requirements, before wheelchair technology, before any semblance of orderly social welfare, and yet Jesus doesn't stand and give a lecture on social justice. Jesus doesn't talk about the needs of the disabled. Neither does he rush first to address the man's physical needs. Jesus 
saw him and addressed his sins. You see that? I'll pull you up by your shirt collar. Now, we have a choice to make. We either decry Jesus as a cold, calloused, indifferent religious leader, or we confess we are materialists and that what we believe is real and what we assume is really important needs to be retrained. It needs to be discipled by Jesus himself. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in his word. Beloved, the unseen isn't unreal. Spiritual is not synonymous with superstitious. Usually the reason we feel more comfortable in that worldview and materialism is because we don't want to face what Jesus sees first, our sins. Throughout history and around the world, there is great tragedy and suffering. But no problem is as deep and as basic and as foundational as our sins. In fact, sin is the root of every other problem we face because our world was made first very good by a good, beautiful, true, and holy God. And we are his handiwork. We live in his universe, on his earth. Everything we have comes from him and is given to us by him. But our response to him By nature, since our first parents rebelled in sin, our response is, go away. Give me that. Don't expect me to acknowledge you. And definitely, don't you dare tell me how to live. I want the life you have given, and I want you to get out of the way while I live it how I want. That is our most basic problem. And it's always in reference to him. In our hatred and murder, we say to God, I don't care about your image and other people. I'll treat people how I want. In our sexual immorality and lust, we say, I don't care what you intend. This is my body. I'll do with it what I want. I'll identify whatever I want. Get away from me. In our theft and our greed, we say, I don't like what you have given me. It's not sufficient. I will get what I want for myself. In our lying and deceit, we say, I don't care about reality the way you see it. I'll make up my own and peddle that as truth. And even in our best moments, those moments we're grateful for, those times of human charity and philanthropy and community service, what's it all for? It's to be congratulated for what we did. And we use as a culture phrases like the triumph of the human spirit the goodness of humanity. This is sin. And for our sin, God has justly cursed our world. And all of our diseases, all of our disabilities, all of our disasters and death itself is owed because of our sin. But then again, who do we blame for all that? God. For making such a bad world with so much suffering and not taking account. It's the world we deserve because We're sinners, and it's been cursed justly. There's very few who have thought about this issue as deeply as the 18th century pastor and theologian Jonathan Edwards. And among many of his poignant insights comes in his sermon called Men Are Naturally God's Enemies. And he makes the observation to challenge the thought, well, I I don't have any revulsion against God, and this is the illustration he paints for us. You say you object to having a moral hatred of God, that you never felt any desire to dethrone him in your life? But that's just because it's always been thought impossible by you. Listen to this. But if the throne of God were within your reach and you knew it, it wouldn't be safe one hour. Who knows what thoughts now arise in your heart at such an opportunity? Who would trust your heart? That's a good test, isn't it? Who would trust his heart before the empty throne of God? Would you leave it to him? Really? And this is true of all of us. That's why the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one seeks God's glory. No one seeks to honor him and give thanks to the God who made us. Not even paralytics living in the first century 
going through enormous hardship. This man's life was hard. It was really hard. And I think we could objectively say this man's life is harder than any life in here this morning. But Jesus doesn't see that first. What Jesus saw first was this man too was a sinner. And regardless of how hard his life had been, he faced judgment for his sin. Those floods were coming to him too. He faced eternity separated from God himself in judgment in hell. Beloved, Jesus saw his sins and he saw his faith. So what he says last in verse two is incredible. He publicly declares, your sins are forgiven. Now, everybody listening here in this Jewish context understood and had categories for forgiveness. Things like Psalm 130, with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Forgiveness comes from one source, from God, the one offended by sin. Forgiveness comes from God, and forgiveness was executed in the temple, in Jerusalem, before the holy priest, the high priest confessed all the sins of Israel, and a goat was sent away, and then he entered the holy place with the blood of a bull and a goat, and covered the holy place, that sinners may dwell in the presence of a holy God. This elaborate and intricate ceremony of confession and sacrifices publicly, and it was repeated every year, annually on the Day of Atonement, so that God's people could remain with him, and God's people had an annual reminder of their sin and of God's holiness, and only by the death of those sacrificial animals did they survive before him. But here, Jesus is in Capernaum, in somebody's house, and with unilateral authority, he just proclaims forgiveness. He declares forgiveness like God. Complete absolution. Notice, too, the finality of his phrase. Your sins are forgiven. It's not an annual cleansing. They're gone. This is a declaration of staggering authority. It's a declaration of divine authority. And so, of course beginning in verse 3, it's going to ruffle some feathers. The next question we want to ask and answer in verses 3 to 6 is, what does Jesus see in the scribes? We now turn and look at the scribes. In the remainder of this interaction, the paralytic is really now just a supporting actor in this. This is interaction between Jesus and the scribes before the crowd as they're watching. The scribes were religious scholars. They were a subset of the Pharisees. And you could kind of describe it as a renewal movement gone bad. The Phariseeism and the scribes that supported them were a reform and revival movement that had gone really, really bad. Phariseeism originally arose to keep God's people faithful to God's word. It's a good idea, right? Good motive. But their zeal far exceeded their knowledge and their wisdom. And though it's rather complicated, we can simplify and summarize Phariseeism down in toward of putting up fences to be extra, extra certain we never sin against God. Or you might summarize it as an if-then philosophy. So for example, if God commanded we shouldn't work on the Sabbath, well then we shouldn't even walk a certain distance because that would be working, even though there's no limits on your walking in the Old Testament on the Sabbath. And so they would put markers outside of town. In fact, they're digging them up all over Israel, these old Shabbat markers that marked the boundary where you could walk on the Sabbath. You step over that, and you walk too far, and you were working. Or you could have, if God says separate from the unclean, well, then don't even eat, don't even touch, don't even be the same room with someone who has a, you know, scandalous, overtly sinful life. And they were so proud about these rules, these fences, that they began to equate them with righteousness, with faith, and with love for God. You want to know if I love God? Look at how I keep all these rules. You want to know if I'm righteous? Look at how I keep all of my rules. And these standards that they erected blinded them to anything outside their expectations. Anything didn't fit within their mold. They took for granted 
that they knew all that God would have to teach them, that they were superior to anyone else. They had nothing left to learn from anyone. And so, when they hear Jesus, verse 3, they say to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Now notice, though, they did see something true. They did see something that actually many people today still refuse to see, that Jesus clearly claimed to be God in the flesh. Listen, claiming the prerogative to absolve sin unilaterally with a word is a claim to be God. That's what that is. It's impossible to look at the Gospels and conclude that Jesus is just a teacher, just another prophet, as many do today, or even whole systems like Islam claim. It's impossible to hold up. Jesus is claiming here on no certain terms to be God in the flesh. And so Jesus is either a blasphemer that needs to be ignored, or he is who he says he is. Now, under the law, blasphemy was punished by death. So you already know where the scribal thoughts are going. This man needs to die. But notice not just what they see rightly, Jesus claimed. Notice what they refused to see, what didn't fit in their traditions. What if Jesus' authority was real? What if his claim was valid? Could he announce forgiveness? And just like we are confronted by our materialism, The scribes were confronted not just to dismiss what didn't fit the way they saw things, that there was still more to learn. They weren't to just deny what they didn't want to be true. And look at quickly at verse 4. Jesus, knowing their thoughts or seeing their thoughts. That's supposed to be funny. That's really funny, actually. You have a group of guys who are indignant about Jesus' claims to deity, and Jesus tells them what's in their hearts. Yeah, that's funny. Jesus sees their thoughts. They can't see. They won't see. And Jesus tells them what's in their hearts. And verse 4, it's evil. Do you see that? It's evil. Not understandable. Not logical. It's illogical. Because he's healing and raising the dead. He's performing displays of power. And it's evil to reject the claims of God who has come to us. A demonstration of of their sin. And friend, it's so important we see that unbelief is not acceptable. It's not neutrality. It's not tolerable. It's not understandable before God. It will be met with judgment. One of the most harrowing sentences in the Bible is Romans 1.20. They are without excuse. That all sinners are without, literally, defense, without an excuse. So clearly has God revealed himself in creation that we have no excuse. So clearly has God revealed himself in the incarnate Son, we are without excuse. The scribe's grumbling is indefensible, has no merit. But Jesus, in verse 5, is full of compassion, even towards these scribes. And he says he's going to make it easier on them. Essentially, Jesus says in verse 5, I'll do the less difficult thing for you. The less difficult thing is to tell this man to rise and walk. Many prophets that God had sent had healed. But if Jesus does heal under God's power... Well, it's really hard for the charge of blasphemy to stick, isn't it? God must be with him. And Jesus also makes it easier on them in another way. He makes it easier because forgiving sins is in, intangible. You could say that all day, and how do we know? You can't see it. But whether or not a paralytic gets up off his mat, that's pretty spectacular and pretty obvious. And so if Jesus' word has the power to do that, And what he said about forgiveness of sin, well, now we have to take that more seriously. And beloved, we have to see that this is the point of the healing. Look at verse 6. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority. That you would know the Son of Man has authority. And with Son of Man, Jesus is not just saying, I'm a genuine man 
That's a claim coming straight from the prophets. That's coming from Daniel 7, verse 13, to be specific. With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. To him was given dominion and a kingdom forever. The son of man was the one who inherited the promises of God to rule an eternal kingdom over God's people. It's another clear claim of authority. Jesus is doubling down on his authority before the scribes, not backing away. He's publicly saying, he's the king. Dominion belongs to me. I'm the one to exercise God's rule over God's creation. And now we must wrestle with it because in verse 6, he turns to the paralytic and says, pick up your bed and go home. With his word, Jesus did what was difficult, making the lame walk to prove he has authority to do what's impossible, forgive sins. And he proves it. And that leads us then to the last two verses and to turn to the perspective of the crowds. What did the crowd see in the Savior? Before everyone, verse 7, the man rose and went home. And Matthew's simple, subtle explanation is shouting to us. He just got up. This man we've all been looking at at Capernaum, he's been at the gate, he's been in front of the synagogue begging for alms, he's just walking around now. And he goes home. Who speaks and the lame just get up? Who has that kind of authority? And so, of course, and the crowd see it in verse 8, what would you be? I'd be afraid, terrified. And that adds to the reality of this encounter. We're so used to in our sort of feeling-driven culture to talk about encountering God sort of as a really good devotional time. But, but when you encounter God in the Bible, you ask him not to kill you. And anytime angels show up, people fall down like they're dead. So with such a manifestation of deity with Jesus' claims, people are afraid. Because that means God is here. And they're glorifying God because such authority belongs to men. And that conundrum is supposed to swirl around in our minds. There's this God authority in a man. Godhood in a man. And the streams of God's promises that they've been awaiting are, are sort of coming and swirling together. God had promised to be with us. God had promised to rule over us. God promised a son of man to save us. Is this the same? Are they just all one? Is the diversity in the one God a diversity of, of persons? We know as God's revealed, yes, that's true. Three persons and one God, and Jesus is the Son. God the Son, God in the flesh. Two natures in one person, human and divine. The Christ, the coming King, the one about whom all the law and the prophets had spoke and promised, and he's there in the flesh. And in his face, they behold the glory of God himself wielding on earth God's authority as a man. And he uses his authority to forgive sins. Don't miss the point. The point of verse 6 is to underscore verse 2 not the other way around. The point of verse six is underscoring verse two. The point of the paralytic walking is to underline and underscore he has authority to forgive sins. He can make such declarations. Now, nobody can just forgive sins with the wave of a hand and a word, not even God. That would deny his justice and his holiness. And the Bible teaches over and over again, by example and precept, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Sin deserves death. Without death, sin can't just be waved away with a wink and a wave. And so the scribes' animosity towards Jesus is going to build and culminate in his death. But that death is not a death that happened on him. I mean, how do you sneak up and kill the guy that raises the dead and heals the lame with the word? You don't. He has to let you. And that's what his authority is for. And the Lord Jesus said in John 10 that he 
No one takes his life. He lays it down of his own accord. He has authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. That's the charge his father gave him. That's his use of authority. He wields his authority to forgive sin. And Jesus announces forgiveness here in Capernaum because he'll accomplish forgiveness on the cross at Calvary. That's why he'd come. And on the cross, he'll shed his blood for sinners. Sinners like this paralytic suffer the judgment that he deserved and rise again to be his righteousness. All who trust him and every other sinner that looks to him. And what we see here in this passage, the the good news we hold to is right here. The good news is not that Jesus come to banish all our earthly temporal struggles, but Jesus has authority to deal with your real problem. And your real problem is your sin. That's our most basic and fundamental problem. There are many, many things in life that make joy difficult. Our economy may ruin us all one day, but our sin will ruin us forever. Physical pain and suffering and illness can make life daily excruciating. But sin will make eternity weeping and gnashing of teeth without hope. Social injustice and oppression and mockery may exclude and deride us, but our sin will keep us out of the company of God and His children forever. What will you do about your sin? You have no problem. Whatever your problems are, there is no problem as deep and as basic and as pervasive as your sin. This is our real problem. And Jesus has authority to deal with that problem. He has authority to announce forgiveness because he has accomplished it and died for sinners and risen again, that all who believe in him are rescued and bought out from their sin. Now one day, he's making all things new, and the end of our salvation is a new heaven and a new earth with no lame, no disability, no disease, nothing to make us weep or joyless ever again. But that's not our basic problem. Our basic problem is is getting entrance into such a world. Our basic problem as sinners is being able to fellowship with the one holy God forever. And so Jesus came first to deal with that and to announce forgiveness. All who come to Jesus with the faith of this paralytic, just trust, complete reliance. They're forgiven, they're rescued, and they're saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are many ways that this encounter should challenge us. There are many things that the Holy Spirit is saying to us from his word, not the least of which would be for us who are Christians, our gratitude and contentment. Certainly many of us are suffering with many things, even this morning, physical and financial and emotional and relational. But Jesus has dealt with our only real problem, our most basic problem, And whatever other conditions the Lord has ordained for our lives today, we can live it with gratitude because our sins are removed in Christ. The Holy Spirit also is challenging us here to think about our teachability before Jesus. And if you're here, friend, and you're not a Christian, I would encourage you to think about the position of the scribes and their assumptions and how easy we just dismiss Jesus and never ask, well, well, what if what he said is true? And how do I know it's not? Don't assume you have nothing to learn from God or his word or his son. Consider his claims and what he says and what he's done and that the only hope of turning from our sin and being rescued from God's judgment is by his word and trusting him. We could look at many things, but I want us to focus on one. I want us to think about our mission as a church. Or keeping with our questions, we could ask and answer, what should the church say? 
What should the church be saying in view of our Lord Jesus and his authority? We need to ask and answer this question again and again because over and over again, the church gets confused and we go astray about our main goal and we get on rabbit trails and we get off the road and we think the main goal is to fix social structures or address man's physical issues, which are numerous. And we know this is a problem just by following our money. As I've already said, American Christians pour tens of billions annually into relief efforts here and around the world. And we give paltry millions when it comes to spiritual issues like evangelists and missionaries and good literature and Bible translations. When we see physical need, we rip out our checkbooks. When we see spiritual need, we rattle around in our pockets for loose change. And that's quantifiable. So we get this confused over and over and over again. And why? Because we're materialists at heart. That's how we think. That's how we've been discipled and conformed by our world. And, and we also don't want to bear the mockery of other materialists. And when we pour material resources into our world, we get on the newspaper and people are excited about the church and maybe they quiet down a little bit about how much they dislike our message. We're good for something. No one is ever going to praise us for sending another evangelist on the field, getting the word of God into a language that someone can understand. It'll never be applauded. I have seen this and felt this directly in my own life. When I just graduated from seminary, I worked for a couple years in a Christian relief organization. My wife had the privilege, her job, she worked in HR for a prominent firm, and related to her job, we spent a lot of time swanky Hollywood hotels, rich and wealthy, elite lawyers, bumping into Woody Allen and Snoop Dogg on the same night one time, actually. <laughs> and they would find out that I helped poor children. Look at this minister student helping poor kids. They'd buy me drinks. I've sat in hotel swanky bars with drinks. Total pagans are buying me drinks. You're so commendable, they would say. Now then we would go have dinner and we'd talk about the gospel and things went a little differently. But it's so attractive. I want to be commendable. I want to have drinks in nice Hollywood hotels. I enjoy that. I want to be applauded by the world. And so Jesus, though, opens our eyes to see the world as he sees it. And our real problem, even in the midst of all the problems in the world, the real problem, the deep problem, the root problem, the bedrock problem, is sin. The problem is sin. And the poor in the majority world with horrendous physical suffering are still facing the flood of God's judgment if they don't turn to Christ. And all around the world, amidst all the tragedy and all the difficulty, sin, sin, sin is still the problem, and sinners are accountable, and they have no excuse for it, ever. And so Jesus opens us up to see that, and to be faithful to address it, and even to invite the mockery of the scribes of our day. Invite the scorn. Jesus stood there in the midst of the scorn, and preached. And we're asked if we're willing to stand up to the ridicule and the mockery and the charge of being irrelevant and useless and pointless in our world. We're asked if we're willing to fail in the eyes of our generation in order to succeed in the eyes of eternity. And Jesus is opening our eyes to this. We get this wrong so often. In the late 19th century in Holland, Abraham Kuyper achieved what many of us would pinch ourselves if God gave this to us in our land. He was a reformed Christian theologian. He was the senior editor of a major newspaper. He was the head of a university and the prime minister. Could you imagine to wake up and to have a reformed believing Christian in the White House running the media and higher education? I mean, we'd pass out with delirium. That's the definition for so many of us as Christians of success and achievement and, and goals. And yet today, just 
about 100 years after Kuiper was in office and had all his positions, Amsterdam is a pit of vile vice and depravity and immorality and Christianity is almost gone. Our life is very brief. Our resources are very small. Where should they go? When Jesus rose again off that cross, he commanded his disciples to preach forgiveness of sins in his name, beginning in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. We are not fixing this world, but we are commanded to point to the one who is making all things new. Point to him who deals with sin and who will bring sinners into his kingdom. Jesus is the only one with the authority to forgive sins. And we Christians, church, we are the only one with the commission to preach his authority. If we don't do it, nobody does. The Holy Spirit is calling us to see how we'll invest our time and our money and our lives into things that material men and women think are commendable or into things that Jesus saw first and commissions us to seek. What will we say? What will we do? We have a helpful illustration in the life of that medical student, Martin Lloyd-Jones. In his 20s, he observed that the rich and poor suffered the same issue. It was spiritual. And that decisive observation went even deeper for Lloyd-Jones because then he then realized, I'm not immune from that issue either. He said later and would testify, God brought me to see the real cause of all my trouble in life and that of all men was an evil and fallen nature which hated God and loved sin. My trouble was not only that I did things that were wrong, my trouble was that I was wrong at the center of my being. And God brought Martin Lloyd-Jones to Christ, and then God brought him to a decision that shocked everybody. This rising prominent star in the medical field who was making headlines left it all to be a preacher and to preach the gospel. And that's what we see in our passage, don't we? The Holy Spirit calls us to bring us all to Christ, to trust the only one who has authority to forgive sin and then leads us to make it our ambition in this brief life to preach Christ, to testify of Christ until he's brought us home with him forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for the clarity of your word and for how it speaks to us, even encounters that are far outside of our context in the first century. They're so clarifying for us in our world. And Father, we pray that we would not just have our our minds renewed, but that our hearts and our hands would follow what you speak to us. We ask the help of your spirit to live not according to the way of materialism, but the way of your son. To see this world and the billions of never dying souls that inhabit it. And to recognize in ourselves and in others that at the bottom of every problem is the real problem of sin. And yet you and your mercy and grace have addressed our sin in Jesus. Father, we pray that forgiveness and salvation found alone in your Son would be often on our lips and would be the deciding factors of our lives. Help us to grasp the ambitions you have for us and to walk by faith before you. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.